What's going on guys? We have one more video to get through. And this is a short one, like the last one. Um so um this is kind of more contextualizing what we've already talked about. Uh but here are our um vocab. It's more economic stuff, which you know, as you can tell, I, I get kind of on diatribes about, but you know, go ahead and follow wait one second. Go ahead and pause me. Um Whenever the thing goes away. Well, I'll be honest, you don't really need to know about this whole company, uh, but whatever. Okay, so when we're talking about economic innovations, we are literally talking about innovations in how economy was done uh, in human history. So this is something kind of implied already. Um, but corporations act a lot like joint stock companies. They are, in fact, I would argue, an evolution of the concept. They exist as risk mitigators, okay? So how it works is that, say, there's a ship, and you, you own the ship, and you're going to sell, you're going to buy goods, and you're going to sell things on that ship. And, um, one day, you you have a full load in this in this in the ship, and you're you're going you're going to America. You're British, British, not British. Um, and the boat sinks. You are 100% liable for the money. You are financially ruined. You, know, you spent all your money buying these goods. They got lost in the seas, and you're done. Financially ruined. Now imagine splitting up the idea of that boat into 100 little pieces, and you sell each percent of the cost of this expedition um, to people. So you fundraise. So you say like, you're in charge of the business and you're like, okay, I'm going to sell, uh, you know, John, Fred, and Sarah, uh, you know, 33%, 25% uh, of the company each. Um, and they pay you for the selling of it. So they have money to pay for the things you want to buy. And then you, um, then you, you have not spent all of your money. You spend 25% of your money. And Sarah and Fred and the other guy, I forgot the name of, they've also spent 25% of their money. Which means if the ship goes bad, you haven't lost all your things, you just lost a quarter of your things. This is great. And what it means is that when the ship comes back and, and you redistribute your profits, you get a quarter of the profits, Sarah gets a quarter of the profits, Fred gets a quarter of the profits, and the person I've read the name of gets a quarter of the profits. Um, so it's a risk mitigate. Um... And that means that if you have to and take on less risk to make money, you are more able to take risks because you can spread your investments out over things that are more reliable, things, some things that are more risky, that are going to have a high reward if, you pay, if, if it does pay out. You could also invest in things that are more stable, so you have something that's always going to make you money, but then this risky thing might make you a millionaire, right? So corporations... Um, make it easier to invest which makes it more likely to invest make makes people more likely to invest which means that there's more money floating out there which means that more adventures are being funded um so the other thing that the book talks about are these ideas and the people who own percentage of a company are shareholders they own a share of the company a share of the profits um the other thing you can do though if your boat is making lots of money and people go to Fred and like, hey, Fred, we would like to buy half of your share in this boat because this boat makes so much money, Fred. You have to, you have to sell it to us. Now, Fred paid $25 for this. And in order to, and, and to sell half to these people, they will pay half of his share. So 12.5% of, of the total share they will pay him $25. So he will make $25 from $12 that he spent, $12 and a half dollars that he spent. It's a huge profit when you think about it. So if a, if a stock makes lots of money, if a percent of a company make, uh, uh, if there's a percent of a company that makes lots of money, you can sell that percent to make even more money. And um, that's why Uber gets sold, because people think Uber's going to make a lot of money one day. Um, but it doesn't necessarily ever, you ever make money because you then you pro, you don't make money off the dividends, off the profit of the company. You make money off the buying and selling of its stock. Um, now, 
Another thing that can happen with corporations is that if they aren't controlled to an extent, certain businesses that are well positioned in the market can kind of snowball enough advantages that they can outcompete their competitors in their industry. What that means is that it's no longer financially viable for any other corporation or entity to exist in that part of the industry, which results in a monopoly, which means that only one person controls what this one, what, what the thing is. Um, these are usually not very favorable to consumers because if Adam Smith says competition drives the market and monopoly is the cessation of competition, and that means that even if people are upset with your practices, they have to purchase what you sell because they want what you sell. Um, and so they're not very favorable to consumers. And you can be a monopoly in two different ways. You can, this is, uh, the, I'm supposed to talk about this specifically. You learn about this more in, in US history. You can be vertically, <laughs> vertically integrated or horizontally integrated. If you're vertically integrated, that means that you can, you own every step of the, of an industrial process from the cultivation and collection of the raw material to the refinement to a raw good to the selling of that raw good. Do you, so you own all the steps of the process which means that you control the price. However, if you have a horizontal integration, that means that you control all of this, all of one step of industrial process. You own all of the raw materials, you own all of the selling, you own all of the refinement to a industrial good, which means that you still also control the price. Um, corporations also become transnational, which is a huge, huge uh, change than how uh, the historic behavior of, of, of uh, businesses during uh, in human history. So historically, uh, a business pretty much operated within the borders of the state that it was born in. But as a result of industrialization, um, communication, tr uh, what is it? The speed at which uh, people can move, the, the scale at which economies can function, businesses can function means that you can have presences in multiple places in the world. Um, and in fact, you want to be present in other places so you can control and influence the places you need to you need to, to be more profitable. Because that's the whole point of a corporation is to be profitable. Because if you're not profitable, you're not you're not making your investors money and then they might they might not want to help you anymore, sell your stock. Um, so a good example of this would be De Beers, led by a man named Cecil Rhodes. Actually, the Rhodes Scholarship is named after this guy. He's kind of bad. He's kind of a racist. His, 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 his mindset has not aged well um, in, our, in the 21st century. Um, but just think about, like, uh, PepsiCo, Nike. Like, there, it's, Nike's not in one place. Nike's all over the world. Nike kind of transcends borders. Um, also, because capital is so important, Banks become more prevalent during this period because uh, extending loans for capital becomes a viable choice during this period. So the final thing to talk about, the final slide is like kind of like a what the heck is this slide doing here? So mass culture is this concept of like industrialization homogenizing culture um, within a state and within the world, within a continent. Um, within a world, within the within a state, within a continent, within the world, um, because things like telecommunication connect people more, people start becoming more similar. But how the book talks about it is this idea of consumerism. So, in order for an industrial economy to work, is people need to buy the things that are being sold, and we're producing things at a rate that we've never produced before. So, there's like a concern that like people will stop buying things. And before industrialization, people did not own lots of clothes. You might have owned a few shirts, a few pants. I'm talking for some people like three shirts, two pairs of pants, some shoes, maybe shoes, not always shoes, right? So how do you, when people buy all the shirts they need and they're cheap, what do you do? You style the shirts. You make the shirts feel unique. You make the shirts make a statement that people, even though they own 65 shirts, they want to own your shirt because your shirt's different from other shirts, right? That's consumerism, is, is, is the mindset of, of first an economy based on the consumption of goods and then the, the efforts made by companies to make people feel like they need to buy things when they 
have what they need. Consumerism is about the things that you don't need. But even then, consumerism plays a role in food, right? Think about fast food ads. Uh, you don't eat fast, you start, people eat fast food for nutrients, but also like they invest in a statement. Um, a, they, you, could, you could eat pasta every day, why don't you? Because you want to try other things, because you know about other things, right? People back in the day definitely ate pasta every day. Um, well, some people did, right? Bread every day, right? Diversity is, um, was not a thing in people's diets. You had taters every day in Ireland. Um, also, there's this idea of a growing middle class. So I've, when I've talked about workers from a social context in this, in this lecture, Mr. Broughton has plenty to say about this, about them as well. Talked about about Whataburger and the, and the chicken shrimp sandwich. Um, the, um, oh, I lost my train of thought because I started talking about Mr. Broughton. Oh, the people who were in control of the middle process of telling workers what to do, you need a lot of those people. And so these people make more money than historically other people had. And so they also, it doesn't require as much work. So they have more downtime. So they can do things like go to the park. The idea of a park also becomes new because the impact of industrialization is heavy pollution, not lots of clean nature in the cities. So ideas like Central Park are developed to give people access to nature inside of these dirty, dusty, smelly cities. You can also go to bike ride. Those are things that people didn't really care about until until like they had leisure time because you used to work until you couldn't work and then you found other things to do that would keep you alive. Um, go to the beach, wear a bathing suit. You know, guys would hide their nipples at the time. You could also go to the club. That's another thing. You could go to dance parties and things like that. The ultimate thing is that people are more connected now. They're seeing more people than they ever had before. The process of urbanization uh, increases the density of humanity. More people are living in the same place. And that means you're seeing more people. You're seeing different people. You're interacting with different ways of life. Um, we also be confronting the gro gross inequality being created by industrialization at the time. Um, yeah. So this is this is this is my thing. This is all I have to say about um, industrialization. Uh, I hope you guys have gotten something out of these lectures, and I hope you guys have a restful break. <laughs>